All right, so as I said earlier, I'm a student of the word, just like you. The difference is I study on YouTube so everybody can see my Bible studies. In this class, it was quite surprising to learn how much the first day of the first month has to do with cleansing. So let's talk more on cleansing. We understand that the way that we cleanse the tabernacle is through baptism. So let's step down through here and look at a few verses associated with baptism. All right now, I'm over here in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. This is John the Baptist speaking here, speaking about the Messiah. John the Baptist is telling that the people of Judea and Jerusalem, the whole town came out to be baptized by him. How this baptism, which seems that John the Baptist invented, it was through that water with a repentant heart that all of the previous sins that had been committed by the individual were able to be washed away and cleansed away. Now, I stress this because many of us weren't taught this when we were baptized the first time. I know I wasn't. When they broke those two inches of ice off of that pool back there in 1987, nobody told me it had anything to do with repentance. What I understood is that because I had eaten communion without being baptized, I was getting somebody, probably myself, in trouble. Not once did I understood that I was being baptized unto repentance. In fact, I went out the very next day and did the same things that I had been doing the days before. So I dirtied myself up and squandered my repentance. That's why I had to get baptized again. But notice right here where he says that there is one that comes after him that shall baptize with fire. This is the true baptism, the baptism by fire. But don't be confused. There's some who will try to separate the water and the fire. No, the baptism by fire comes by way of the water. You have to have the water in order to be baptized by the fire. The water is to the body as the fire is to the spirit to say that the water cleans your body as that fire cleans your spirit but they go hand in hand now you look right here in the book of Luke in chapter 3 and it appears as though John the Baptist is refusing to baptize people who did not realize that they were supposed to have a repentant heart you look up there in verse 7, he says, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. It seems as though John the Baptist is sending these guys away and tell them to become repentful. Don't be doing this for vanity's sake, because that's not what it's about. Now, for some hearing this, they're going to believe that you can only be baptized in a church. Well, I don't believe that requirement was of the scripture. Because when you look at Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. This is the Messiah talking to all of us. This is called the Great Commission. And it's not just given to pastors or preachers. It's given to everyone, all of the children of the Father, telling all of us to baptize people. So being baptized down at the church, although it may be convenient, it's not necessary. You can be baptized by your spouse or your parent or even your child in your bathtub. You got to understand, it has nothing to do with the person that's doing the baptism. They're not special at all. It has nothing to do with the vessel in which you're being baptized. That's not special. 
What's special is the water. The first time that I was baptized and felt the fire of the Holy Ghost come upon me, I was baptized in a bathtub by my wife. Two previous times before that, I could look back and recognize no change in my life. But that third time that I was baptized by my wife in the bathtub was a true turning point in my life as I could point to an overwhelming spirit of wisdom that took over my life from that point on. And I believe that it was because of the understanding that I was getting repentance at that point. Whereas before, I was just doing so because somebody told me to do it. That third time was the first time that I had made a decision to do it by the spirit or on my own, so to say. Now, let's talk about that name there when it was talking about being baptized in the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. Now, you have to remember that was the Messiah talking and to say that. For us to be baptized in his name or might not come across as being too humble. Maybe that's why he said in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Because when you look up here in the book of Acts, it seems as though we are to be baptized in the name of the Messiah. You look down there in verse 12, he says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And you come down here to chapter 19 of the book of Acts. You see right there, they're talking in verse 12. They're talking about whether these individuals have received the Holy Ghost or not. The spirit of wisdom I was talking about earlier. And they were like, no, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And then in verse three, he says, and he said unto them, unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. So now what that's saying is that the baptism of John was different than the baptism that they were expected to do. All of these individuals were baptized not only by John, but by the disciples of the Messiah. Who would have carried on the same baptism as, the, as John. But you look right here in verse four, it says, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, says verse five, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So no longer were they being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, but they were being baptized in the name of the Messiah. And then after the fact, you see down there in verse 6, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now I mentioned it that third time that I was baptized by my wife in the bathtub, that was another significant change in from the previous two baptisms, is that I was baptized in the name of the Messiah. Now, back then, I was still calling him Jesus which lends to the idea that it is the understanding of who we are being baptized in. But there are many people today who will be getting baptized in the name Yehoshua HaMashiach. They will be baptized in the name of Yeshua. They will be getting baptized in the name of Yasun, if you understand the Greek, and various other names. But my point is, is that they're being baptized in the name of the Messiah. Which, in my life, and according to the scripture, makes a difference. And so that may be another reason why we should all be considering getting baptized again, making sure that we are all baptized in the right name, making sure we all get this Holy Ghost being talked about in Acts chapter 19. We look here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, how Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It is through this baptism that we receive the Holy Ghost. Now, there's a lot of ministers out there who 
will argue differently. They will say that you don't have to get baptized, that there's no need to get baptized. And they'll sit there in a congregation full of people and explain to them through sermon after sermon how it is so unnecessary for them to be baptized. But then when you ask them, okay, were you baptized? They'll say yes. Now that reminds me of the Catholic Church. I went to a Catholic Church one time and they was having communion and I noticed that when it came time for the wine, it was only the priest who got to drink the wine while the people in the pews didn't get any of the wine. And that's similar to what's happening when a person tells you that you don't need to be baptized. They're taking of the repentance and telling you that you don't need that repentance. So in essence, they are they have ensured that they have the Holy Ghost, but they don't care whether you get it or not. So don't be fooled when somebody tells you that you don't have to be baptized. They may be trying to trick you. Down here in chapter 8 and verse 16, making a relationship between the Holy Ghost, you see in verse 15, and being baptized in the name of the Messiah there in, in verse 16. Down here at 19, talking about how they were baptized in the name of the Messiah and uh, how they received the Holy Ghost down there in uh, verse 6. The, the reasons for being baptized again are piling up. One, we may have been baptized in the wrong name. Two, we may not have received this Holy Ghost or this spirit of wisdom or the, the, this comforting spirit that we were promised. Three, we were, did not have a repentant heart. Or four, we have somehow soiled ourselves since we got baptized the first time. And probably five or six other reasons that I can't think of right now on how the reasons for getting rebaptized are starting to outweigh the ones to not be baptized again. Now, Jumping down here in the book of Galatians and chapter 3, we can make the understanding that baptism is the token of the new covenant. The same way back there with Abraham, in order to be in the Abrahamic covenant, you have to be circumcised. In order to be in the Mosaic covenant, you have to keep the feast days. In order to be in the covenant of the Messiah, you have to be baptized. You see right there in 27, he says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Meaning we are the children of God by faith in Christ. You see right there in 28, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female for ye are all in Christ Jesus. Once we have been baptized in his name. Baptism is the token of that covenant. We jump down here to 1 Peter chapter 3 and 21. It says, The like figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are saved through baptism. For those who say that it's unnecessary to be baptized, well, we ought to take this verse to them and say, well, is it necessary to be saved? Because it is through baptism that we are saved. Now, notice that part right there. It says, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. Now, see, to understand what's going on there, when we think about baptism and what's going on there, how baptism saves us. Well, you heard the story of how we're all sinners come short of the glory of God. That's talking about how we have all broken his commandments and have done bad stuff in the past according to his commandments and according to his rules. Especially those of us who were always taught by the church that we weren't supposed to keep the rules in the first place. That they were antiquated and for those people a long time ago and they didn't keep them and there's no need for us to try to keep them. Well, we didn't even try to keep those rules at all well by breaking those rules we created stains on our spirit and imbalances in the universe that we now have to pay for that's why the world is going through this huge purification process is because we all have a lot of making
waking up to do? Well, through baptism and repentance, we actually wash away those sins that were on our spirit before. And once our spirit is clean, we can become spiritualized individuals again and start to hear our conscience. And our conscience is where the Father dwells. So we can start to hear His voice and start to understand what it is and His will for our life. And then taking it a step further, as we go into this tribulation with all of these hardships and different trials and stuff that the world is about to go through, it's through that inner voice that we can now hear because we have a clean spirit that we can start getting those necessary instructions to help us to be in the right places when some of this bad stuff stuff comes down up on the earth this this spirit will be leading us from within guiding us the same way they were guided in the wilderness back there by fire and the cloud that fire and the cloud was a living parable of how we will be guided in today by the spirit and by the conscious but we have to have baptism to cleanse away those stains. It is because it is those stains on our conscience and on our spirit that will create separation between us and the Father, making us distant from Him to where we can't hear His voice in the first place. And if we go in this tribulation, not being able to hear His voice and get those instructions, we're not going to survive. We're not going to be saved at all. We're not going to make it. If you can't hear the Father's voice, the only other voices that you can listen to are the voices of man or voices of the government, voices of the television. And none of those voices are going to be able to guide you through the tribulation. But let me jump over here to the book of the Shepherd of Hermas because it has some important information on baptism over here. Now, if you aren't familiar with the book of the Shepherd of Hermas, you can find a link to it down there in the description. And you can find many classes that we've done on this book, including introductory classes. But I want to jump over here to the second book of the Shepherd of Hermas called Commands. And I want to look in Command 4. As Hermas is questioning the angel of repentance, he says, And I said unto him, I have even now heard from certain teachers that there is no other repentance besides that of baptism when we go down into the water and receive the forgiveness of our sins, and that after that we must sin no more but live in purity. So Hermas is wanting confirmation from what he's heard is that there is no other repentance besides that of baptism. And how baptism cleanses away our sins, how we receive forgiveness of our sins through that baptism and have to and how we have to go on to sin no more, but live in purity. Now, Herman seems to have a little bit of concern about this as if somehow he's messed up and not lived in this state of purity since the first time he was baptized. And so the angel goes on to tell him right there in verse 19 he tells him, that is true what you have heard, but let me explain this to you right here. And I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, not to make an excuse for those who have sinned and those who plan it on sinning hereafter, but let me make this clarification for you. And he said unto me, thou hast been rightly informed. Nevertheless, sin now thou inquirest diligently into all things. I will manifest this also unto thee. Yet not so as to give any occasion of sinning either to those who shall hereafter believe or to those who have already believed in the Lord. For neither they who have newly believed or shall hereafter believe have any repentance of sins but forgiveness of them. Let's, let me jump down here to verse 21 because the angel of repentance is talking about those of us who did not live in this state of purity since the first time we were baptized. It says, but as to those who have been called to the faith and since that are fallen into any gross sin, the Lord has appointed repentance because God knoweth the thoughts of all men's heart and their infirmities. 
and the manifold wickedness of the devil who is always contriving against the servants of God and maliciously lays snares for them. So this is a this is a difference between those of us who have to get baptized again and those who've got baptized the first time. Now, the way I'm understanding this is when it, when you baptize the first time, you get forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins meaning you don't have to pay them back. But once we've messed up that first baptism and have stained our spirit again like the majority of us have done, we get repentance of sins. And it says that the Lord has made this provision for us because the Father knows the hearts of man, their infirmities, and the manifold wickedness of the devil who is always contriving something against the servants of God. So the Father knows how it is for us, and so he's given us the opportunity to be baptized again. We should take advantage of that. You look down here in the third book of the Shepherd of Hermes called Similitudes. This is Similitudes 9. Look at here at verse 154. He says, Now that seal is the water of baptism, into which men go down under the obligation of death, but come up appointed unto life. Talking about the seal of the Son of God. That seal that we need in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You see up there in verse 152, it says, They therefore being dead were nevertheless sealed with the seal of the Son of God and so entered into the kingdom of God. So if we want to be saved, it, it, we have to have this baptism. And what is this baptism? If we want to be saved, we have to have the seal of God or the seal of the Son of God. And what is this seal? This seal is baptism. Baptism is the seal. Now, we've done classes on the Shepherd of Hermas. The Shepherd of Hermas is a very sophisticated book that explains the hearts of humanity and how we have to change our, the way we are in order to go into the kingdom of heaven. We have to put away those powers that we hear about over there in the New Testament says we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We have to put away those wicked powers out of our life and take on virtues. Well, in this book, the vision that Hermes saw was put in all of humanity in the form of stones. Each one of us was depicted as a different stone with different flaws and such. And one of the stones that you'll read about is these stones that says right there in verse 75, and what are the rest which fell by the water and could not roll into the water? He says, they are such as have heard the word of God and were willing to be baptized in the name of the Lord, but considering the great holiness which the truth requires, have withdrawn themselves and walked again after wicked lust. Talking about the people who refused to be baptized. These are people who considered the great holiness with the truth required and decided they didn't want to live in that truth. They would rather live in wickedness and they went again after their wicked lusts. These will be of us who refuse to be baptized again as well. We're, we're going after our wicked lusts and the only way we can be cleansed of those of that wickedness is through baptism. And instead of being baptized again and living clean, we rather just go on and live dirty. But whatever we decide to do, getting off to a clean start maybe should be the thing. But our primary goal should be the purification of our sanctuary, cleaning out that inner court, making ourselves ready for the temple of God to fall upon mankind. Shalom.